Welcome to Ink More Pork Historian's Guild. Today we will be reviewing the book Moving Pictures. My name is Pertis and I use they them pronouns. Uh, my name is Mulch. I also use they them pronouns. It is I, Chio, and I use she her pronouns. Ooh. Woo. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, so moving pictures. Uh this one was pretty good. This one, like, like kind of bomb. Like, this was bomb. I like yeah, this one I, a lot. <laughs> I'm so like glad this we're into one. the good books. I know. Oh, yeah. I mean, the next two books are Reaper Man and Witches Abroad. Mm, mm, mm. Nice. Yeah, I nice. actually thought way more highly of this, uh, reading it for, it for this podcast, than I did when I first... Um, read it on my own mm -hmm. uh, because previously I was reading it as part of the you know industrial revolution books and I like the other three books in the industrial revolution segment better uh-huh so it hadn't occurred to me that as early on in Discworld as this is this is one of the best ones in Discworld so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, by by kind of a lot, in my opinion. I, I was actually yeah. truly astounded by the development here. And and I mean mm -hmm. this is this is classed as one of the Industrial Revolution books, but in many ways it isn't. It doesn't follow a lot of the same advancement structure that all the other Industrial Revolution books like eventually will, except for maybe the truth. But that's because the truth is a weird book. Um, yeah, you've read but the truth? I, I have read the truth, but a very long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's number twenty-five. We won't we won't reach it for another year. Yeah, the thing with this book is that the advancement doesn't stay. Yeah. Like they have to like stop making moving pictures after this book because uh, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> For a lot um, of reasons outlined within the book itself. <laughs> yes. Um, so it doesn't have that actual advancement that the other books do. Like, like you know, the, the post office book, you, you have a functioning, like, mail service at the end of the book, and you do for the rest of the Discworld books. Uh, this one, you had, you had movies. You had them. People remember them. Um, and then you didn't have not, movies. You're, they're not happening anymore. And in fact, people didn't even remember... Most people didn't even remember that there had been movies by the end of it. Yeah. I yeah. thought they did. Really? So no, their uh, memories got wiped. Some of their oh, memories God. got wiped. They basically... <laughs> it was like a bad dream, essentially, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't, um, I didn't really catch that. I would um, say, at the end of the truth... The truth is about the invention of the printing press. The printing press is still a thing at the end of the truth. That's true. Yes. That is true. That is true. So, I yeah. I also say, um, just... another less uh, definite aspect is that most of the other uh, most of the other industrial revolution books outside of Raising Steam are, uh, are mystery stories. Mm -hmm. Or, well, actually, only two of them are. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't mysteries. agree with that. Because Going Postal is like it, almost a noir <laughs> in its weirdness, in, in, in the way they present it. Um, yeah. Um, but not a mystery noir, just, uh, just a noir style, <laughs> I guess. Mm hmm. Um, I think it, I think it's interesting to group this as an industrial revolution book because I actually don't think it is right. If we look at it, right, yeah. the next industrial I, revolution I'm, book like, wouldn't come until the truth. That's book number twenty five. We're at book number ten right now. Oh now, wow! The concept. I think that what's important about this is that he's playing with the concept of what would it be like to advance Discworld. What would it mean? to play around with how this world exists. Can I do stories 
about modern day technologies in this fantasy world and what does that make me do? Because that's what makes these books so good is because he asks himself the question and I think his answer to it in this book is really funny. He asks himself (laughs) the question, do we react this way to technologies because of their inherent existence or do we react um, differently in very different situations? If I put these technologies in a medieval world, what is the reaction like? Right, And in this one, mm-hmm. he decided very clearly, no. If I put Hollywood in the normal fantasy world, they would just ignore it. <laughs> because it's insane to run off on your dreams like that on this magical whim that you'll become a movie star. That is a really crazy thing. It's something that couldn't happen in fantasy Britain. <laughs> it barely happened in real Britain. You know. <laughs> Hollywood is something that could only arise because of the like weird confluence of events in America at this time for this reason. Um, and so he had it be magic. He had it be mind control. The only reason you would run off to follow dreams would have to be mind control. Which is mm-hmm. uh, a really fascinating take on that concept. Um, Man. And- and I think it's just such a good way to experiment with it, right? Like, I think that's really why he had the movies disappear at the end. It's like, he's not tied down to it. If he wants to experiment with advancing Discworld, this is a great way to tell that story without being stuck down to it with a subject that, you know, it's not a problem, right? It's not a problem if Discworld doesn't have movie theaters, right? It's yeah. a problem if Discworld yeah. doesn't have cameras, it's not a problem if Discworld doesn't have movie theaters. It doesn't really change anything. You know, if you never read this book, if it was removed from the canon, it would have no impact on your interpretation of this story. You would never have a moment that was like, hey, why doesn't Discworld have movies? I have uh, a yeah. question. Yeah, hit me. Is this the first time we've seen the... Uh, since the first two Discworld books that we've seen the imps and the box the imps in the box I, I think there were some in guards guards don't think so i'm looking back and i mean they're they're i think so there are definitely imps in other guard movies but i i don't know about guards guards i don't think um, there is anything involving photography in the first Guards, guards. Hmm. Then, uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> probably a first time in a while, at the very least. Um. Mm-hmm. Why do you ask? Is I think this is the first one where we see them really, uh, sort of playing around with the idea of the imps in the box, their maintenance, um, Basically needing, like, a lot of imps do what they're trying to do. Yeah. And sort of exper- trying to experiment <laughs> with trick photography. Mm-hmm. Well, it, we can nail their feet down to the, the bottom of the box, and then we can move it around, maybe. It's it's a much, it's <laughs> much more brutal. Through. Yeah, it, it's, it's a... Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to reach because what's really interesting to me about the industrial revolution in Discworld is that actually a lot of the biggest technological changes don't happen in one of the industrial revolution books. They happen in men at arms. Um, men at arms. Mm-hmm. Fucks. Men at arms introduces so good. men at arms introduces the imp phone. It introduces the clacks. It introduces, um, some other tech too. Some no, other... uh, it doesn't yeah, it's actually. So it doesn't that there's actually not... introduce well, hold on, the hold on, phone. Hold on, hold on. One other book time. on the clacks, like like the clacks just like pop up. Yeah, I mean, going postal is a it, book about right. the clacks. You're right. It does uh, introduce the phone. Sorry. The yeah, the disorganizer. <laughs> yeah. The um, truth explores the info in much greater detail. Yeah, yeah but the truth doesn't come funny. until ten books after the Minute Arms. 
Yeah. Which is crazy. Um, Sorry, I'm just really excited for you guys to read uh, the truth. Yeah, it's been a long time. I'm excited to review it. We'll reach it in yes, one year's time. Um, I think the truth might be the most underrated Discworld book. Um, valid. Okay, but uh, but yeah. So I, it's it's interesting because you know he's getting the idea, but he's just not there yet. Like he's just not at the point where he's. Um. Like, really attached to the idea of advancing things or doing Industrial Revolution stories. Like, he just doesn't have that concept yet, really, which is, like, very clearly cool. He wants to see if he can advance this. He wants to experiment with his storytelling around this technology. Um, but he... And it's, it's so lovely to see him touch on these ideas which produce some of his best works, in my opinion... Uh, so early on, so far mm -hmm. before he does any of that other shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> I gotta say, the supporting yeah. cast in this one is really endearing. Every single like, character in this one. Yeah, I like. Except for the wizards, like, I don't. <laughs> I don't care about the main cast in this. The two protagonists in this that much. Like, I think they're fine and they carry the story perfectly well. But like, I really like the supporting cast. I kind of, I felt the same way. I wasn't overly attached to Victor or, um, I just uh, forgot, I, for, I forgot Ginger, her name. Ginger, I think yeah. her name. Ginger. Ginger is correct. Yeah. I, I wasn't, and I think that's, that, that's kind of what held this back below some other books for me, um, was that I wasn't super attached to the two main characters. But I did, I loved the supporting cast. I loved seeing, like, this is the only book I've seen where cut your own throat dibbler is a like serious character in it instead of just like a background character um is it, but we see detritus for the first time we see gaspo the wonder dog for the first time both like big characters in the watch books um you don't see detritus for the first time in this oh uh, i mean we've seen him much we, we've seen him like briefly before but like this he's is never the first been one like a, where he's like an actual a, character. Yeah, yeah, and we see his his uh, how his marriage to Ruby starts, which, uh, like I don't think we ever see Ruby again, but she's she's mentioned a lot. Yeah, yeah, she is. No, I I really yeah. love that, and I think that you're right think... that Victor and Ginger aren't the most interesting characters and and certainly not by far i do wish especially with victor that he had leaned into some of the early concepts because his introduction to victor got me extremely excited his uh it's the same problem as mort with victor well with victor he has this excuse right where for the entire content of the book after that introduction he's genuinely not himself and genuinely mind controlled by a cthulhu like chthonic god mm -hmm. to some extent like any moment after the the snap where he runs off to hollywood that's he's partially controlled by a chthonic god and that's the excuse for why he does anything I mean, mm -hmm. kind of. Because they do have bits where he is genuinely not himself. Where he is like, he snaps. Or he has periods where he he loses time or where uh, he just cannot remember what he has done. And those are the periods where he is explicitly mind controlled. I would say, I would phrase it as actively mind controlled. Because Gaspo yeah. says, you know, you've you've got the shine on you, or whatever the fuck. Um, you know, he's got this look to him all the time, like all the time. He's been drawn to Hollywood, Hollywood, and he's trying to do these things, and he believes in these ideas because of the the dreams of Hollywood. Yeah, but again, I think it is an issue where there are a lot of ideas with Victor that I feel like 
Terry Pratchett had just leaned in a little more, they would have been a lot more memorable and entertaining. Yeah, and I agree with that. that like, I mean, that's what I'm saying is I wish that he had leaned in more on these things from the introduction. Yeah, because I mean, in a way, it's like a perfect combination is Victor is a guy who goes to great lengths to do as little, to expend as little effort as possible. And sort of inadvertently, and also being mind controlled to become like the most famous movie star in the world are two ideas that are very compatible and could have been great. Yeah. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, and there, you can see little seeds of it where he comes in, becomes an actor, and doesn't even know what acting is, or even this, or it, and he doesn't even have the faintest idea of how to go about it. There are people around him who have been busting their ass trying to be actors, and he just sort of, which I thought, magics his way, which into was becoming, kind of inconsistent. Just because they had said that he was an actor before. Um, but. Yeah. Was a little inconsistent, but. Yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't quite work, but it almost does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think it would have been interesting. There are moments, but it never really clicks. Yells. Yeah, um, and it makes him a little sad. I will say Gaspode is like the... I love Gaspode. Gaspode is so good in this. Uh, He's perfect, and I would protect him with my life. Um, Gaspode the Wonder Dog. Uh, He's so... He's such a great addition to this book. He... Victor's kind of an idiot in for like most of the book and I would not have survived if there was not someone like Gaspo to just kind of like knock him down a little bit <laughs> tell yeah. him what to do yeah. um i mean honestly all four of the um sentient animals newly sentient animals provide just like a phenomenal laugh um yeah yeah uh, and honestly there are so so many funny references in this um like even his stage name uh, victor maraschino is like very clearly victor mature uh a mature oh, i thought it was victor valentino Ooh, that might be a good one too i thought it was victor mature because he's got the uh, sultry gaze that victor valentino was iconic for but he's got the the sparkling smile that victor mature was very famous for uh-huh I think we might both be right. <laughs> because that's what I thought, is Victor Mature's backlog of stuff is a lot of those, like, saving a scantily clad lady in an adventure film type shit. Um, uh, so I thought it was Victor Mature, but honestly, Victor Valentino works too. It, it, would, it would honestly just be... Um, many victors in star business i mean it's a good name it's a it's a great name it's a sexy name true um (laughs) my my favorite joke is um when uh the alchemist is uh talking about this film that uh dibbler has taken over doing the poster for and uh Dibbler is going like, well, are there any scenes of people dangling over the sides of cliff cliffs? And he's like, well, no, there is one scene uh, on a balcony. And then he's like, he's talking about the monologue that they had to cram in small text across multiple cards. Yeah, because they're doing silent films. Just lost my shit. Yeah. Man. Oh. Uh, yeah. I did not tell that, explain that joke very well. Um. Literally, there are fucking 100 jokes uh, referencing movies and film. Almost everything is 
um, in this book, the uh, Ginger's real name is Theda Withel, uh, which like mm, is kind of like there's a lot of ideas of what that might be. Uh, her Get stage name is Ginger. Her I thought her stage name was uh, Dolores Bissin. Her first stage name is Ginger Rogers, and then it becomes Dolores Dissin. So, uh, we meet her as Ginger. We call her Ginger throughout the book. It's not her real name. Her real name is Theta Whittle. Whittle? Um, which might be a reference to Theta Barra, who is a famous movie star. Her secondary name, Ginger, is very much Ginger Rogers. Um, she keeps, like, <laughs> referencing Marilyn Monroe. She, like, constantly fantasizes about um, the, like, famous scene. The, the... If they're standing on the grate, her, yeah. her uh, skirt's billowing out. <laughs> yeah. There's like 100 uh, lines that are referencing an action movie. I think he's really getting those out of his system because he loves those so much. He does. My favorite, uh, another one of my favorite jokes is the climax where uh, the giant uh, eldritch being has taken Ginger's form and is climbing the Tower of Ankh while holding the screaming librarian in yeah. hand. Yeah, yeah. Reverse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kong. Um. Yeah, uh, I did. I did like the choice of the librarian as the damsel in distress for the climbs climax. I mean, they really uh, just spent so long setting up the reverse King Kong scene. That's that was and it was choice. worth it. That paid that was... off so well. <laughs> it was. He spent a really long time trying to do it. That's. Was pretty choice. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed if it I too. were him, I would have uh, smashed. I would have uh, chugged a bottle of wine after writing that, and then smashed the bottle. <laughs> you do that for everything. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> honestly, the problem is we can't stop you from doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, and then all of the movies they produce are real movies. They produce a. Uh, Gone with the Wind, Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, shit. It's, for reference to those listening, it's been like a week since we read this book because work sucks and we shouldn't have to do yeah. it. So they do Gone with the uh, Wind, Lawrence of Arabia. Fuck. I think they do uh, Conan the Barbarian. Oh, yes, yes. They do a, um, yeah, a Conan the Barbarian bit. It was their first film was Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, it was. And um, because he's still alive, they were like, hey, um, did we ask him for this? <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah, he'll see. <laughs> Got and one it. kind of funny thing is that I was reading a history of, like, cinem narrative films while I was, at the same time when I, while I was listening to the audiobook. It was just really funny looking at sort of uh, the parallels or, like, the things that Terry Pratchett is parodying. Mm, uh-huh. Parodying. See, he parodied parody so much like he he can cram so much parody into this bad baby <laughs> bad. Uh. and like very early on in hollywood uh before like before a lawsuit put an end to it they would do film adaptations of just anything Regardless yeah. of whether it was under copyright or not, regardless of whether or not they had permission. Yes. Uh -huh. Which became quite um, quite extreme at times. Um, oh. Man. There are so many good fucking jokes in this book, y'all. <laughs> I 
I loved I loved that they stuck Donald Duck into it. Like that that part really got me was the Donald Duck bits. The where the duck is just like incomprehensible to everybody but the other animals, so they have to translate. They also had Tom and Jerry in there. They did have Tom and Jerry. Um Yeah. Uh, I gotta say, um, with the wizards, I actually like the wizards in this. So, um, yeah, I I don't agree. The wizards were the one thing that just felt like chaff in this book. They didn't really end up having an impact on this story. It kind of felt like we wasted a lot, a lot, a lot of time with the wizards. In a way that didn't make me enjoy any of the actual characters in this story very much. Um, I will say I liked them more than I have in the past. Because Rid Cully's there. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, only <laughs> only because Rid Cully is there. And I forgot yeah, how this, much I missed this him. Is the, <laughs> this book is the book that introduces Rid Cully, Rid Cully. And he is such a welcome addition to the wizard's. Yeah, yeah, because he balances also, it out Ponder so Stibbons. well. I think Ponder Stibbins made an appearance as a student in one of the earlier books. But he, he's actually still a student in this. He, Seeing well, Ponder Stibbins as a student is so weird to me. He yeah. well, he graduates. Yeah. What does he? He becomes a grad student. I don't really understand. Um, he, he doesn't in this book. He passed uh, that test and it seemed to mean yeah, something. Yeah, he, he didn't graduate to <laughs> oh. being a wizard, yeah. Okay, so he is a wizard now. Yes. Okay. Yes. And he, um, uh, he has an eldritch monstrosity dropped on him while he's trying to sneak out to get booze. Which happens to a lot of us. Yeah. Just one of the, the risks of acquiring alcohol um. <laughs> so yeah it was it was fun to see I, one thing one thing that bugged me like I wasn't super attached to Victor or Ginger but they didn't get like endings at all like like they don't know what they're doing with their lives now they're kind of just like at a loss at the end of the book like they don't move on to do anything else like she gets some marriage offers but she doesn't she's not gonna accept those and she's she's you know they've got got to both find other th things to do in their lives now and we'll just never know what those are yeah and we will literally never know they do not ever appear again yes yeah they're one of very few main characters that nobody ever even references again yeah um yeah uh, which makes sense. They weren't very memorable, but yeah, but... I mean, I I don't feel like he particularly liked them. It's kind of implied that they're going to like at least hang out together regularly, which is nice. But um, you know, we 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 don't need to see these guys. <laughs> That's okay. But they're just like, what are they going to do with their lives now? I think yeah. that the point is that they're going to do whatever. The same thing that all of us do with our lives, right now. That I mean, that fame true. really brought them nothing, right? You're still at the yeah. end of the day just a person who's still got to yeah. live and still it, got to die. Like it's just that like Victor is like actively like worse off than when he started this. Like just because part of this narrative has been about them trying to like find employment and it ends with them unemployed. <laughs> like <laughs> I found Frustrating. <laughs> I found funny, but also frustrating. Um, well, in a lot of ways, they both are better off. Because at the beginning of I the mean, story, both of them are in a stagnant state. Where they like have made the infinite choice of their life, right? She was in a state yes. where she was just a milkmaid forever. He was in a state where he was just a student forever. They were both, to some huh. extent, scared... To actually and, go and do something. <laughs> to be honest, being a student forever sounds really fucking dope. Yeah, well, go do it, asshole. Go on. Yeah. Do I look like I have infinite money? 
Why do you look GD. like? Uh uh-uh, uh, you don't have to pay loans until you leave school. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So as long as you never leave school, if you want to actually be a student forever until you die, that's not a problem. Hmm. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're a student aid finance beneficiary, don't quote me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't don't fucking email me. Um, but yeah, like, go to school. Go to school. Um. No, I mean, it doesn't sound the worst unless you are training to be a wizard and there aren't actually subjects at school. It's just magic. And you know more than the teachers. Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't sound very good. (laughs) Because once you're a wizard, once you're a wizard, you get to learn and do whatever you want forever is the thing. Literally. Yeah, you should go back to Unseen Anniversary. Unseen university. <laughs> university. Go back to Unseen Academicals. Wizard. Unseen Academicals really is the best wizard book, in my opinion. It's not a wizard book, but it's the best one. Well, we'll get there in three years. Yeah. Or more. But that's that's book that's number. That's not even a joke. That's just a fact. Well, yes, it's been what? six. It's been six months that we're at book ten, which means we're actually doing pretty good. But pretty pretty good's kind of bad. Um, I think it was interesting because I think that this was one of the books he's produced with kind of the least to say, which I thought was really interesting. Like, he's fascinated by movies and the effects that they've had on us. And he's like, you know, telling a story about that and telling a story about fame. And, you know, that's great. But it's also kind of clearly not his world and by focusing actors in this way he's almost making this strange little guesswork to it um which i think comes across in the story in having kind of what you're talking about where this ending just doesn't really feel like anything right it doesn't feel super satisfying like i was okay with it like the the final scene where they're just having this discussion was was fine you know i wasn't blown away i don't think he said anything that was particularly interesting or new in that scene you know Mm -hmm. but uh that doesn't surprise me (laughs) yeah you know he's he's really telling a story that's outside of his traditional depth or what he knows in his world you know he's never really a guy even when he was incredibly famous um who took to that very well, right? Like, you know, he he never really understood that. He was always kind of apart from that. And, and that reads very strongly in this book. Uh-huh. Um, oh, and we had been talking about the wizards before the blinds. Yeah, I, I really just don't feel like they added a lot to the story, except for interstitial breaks. If we had gotten that time instead to, like, understand Victor or understand Ginger better, I would have been significantly happier than if I had spent all that time. Especially the weirdness with the uh, the reality calculator or whatever the fuck. Mm-hmm. Like, I really, yeah. I really strongly... I like those because well, I just really enjoyed seeing them. I thought they were funny and entertaining. But they have to build to something. Right? Like, if we spend all this time in the narrative looking at the reality measurement box, and at the end, the reality measurement box just turns off, and that's, like, the conclusion of that narrative, like, I don't give a fuck about it, right? Like, it doesn't do anything. The only thing that the wizards genuinely provided to the story is one section where they... Produce an illusory flame, which the Hollywood monster is afraid of because it is itself an illusion and therefore has to follow the rules of illusion. That is the only actual story act that they contribute to. Which is crazy when we spent a fair amount of the book 
watching what they were doing. Mm hmm. Like that. Man. That felt very the unsatisfying only... to me. Yeah. I found the only scene I enjoyed with them was them sneaking into the movie theater. I enjoyed. Enjoyed that scene. Any other time we spent with them, I did not care about. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed Rig Coley's like, antics. Like, mm -hmm. I enjoyed them. They just didn't provide to the narrative. Mm -hmm. Which is kind yeah. of a trap that Terry Pratchett sets for himself a lot in his early books, right? You know, they're not tight. They're not composed. He will spend a lot of time telling a joke that does not lead to anything at all whatsoever like <laughs> within that character or within that story um i'm i'm excited to see him get better at it right because there's like for instance you can compare this exact arc to like hogfather right mm -hmm. and hogfather would cut to the wizards a lot trying to figure out what the fuck is going on and like getting little clues and stuff like that and then they become part of the story, right? They actually do something. They contribute, and we get everything so perfect with the God of Hangovers. I truly love him. Oh God, I love, I love the God of Hangovers. Um, and it makes sense, and it provides. I mean, and this is the most important thing wizards always do. It provides more understanding of what's going on within the like find foundational dynamics of Discworld. But that's not really true in this one. In this one, very much so, Victor and Gaspod do seem to understand what's going on. And we can get the idea that reality is weakening because we're an outside viewer. So we don't really need a device within the narrative to reinforce that. Right? Was it a surprise for mm -hmm. either of you when they reveal that it's a reality measurement machine? No, it was not a surprise. Because no. it feels like it's supposed to be, but like f because we're outside of viewers, it's very, very obvious that that's what it is and what it's pointing to. It's very obvious yeah. to us that it's pointing towards Hollywood. It is a reality measurement machine and shit's going bad. But we already all knew all that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So. I just liked seeing the wizards, though. I like. I really See, I never liked enjoy that. time with the wizards. <laughs> I really like that don't like gross them. elderly wizard who was in the the giant wheelchair that was built like a tank. Yeah, the horrible man. He appears a couple of other times, and then he's dead later, right? I think so. But I liked him in this. I felt like the wizard dynamics were a lot better fleshed out. Yes. And they'd ever been before. They they definitely yeah. were. They definitely were. And like I there was no point where I had to stop and be like, oh, 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 God. Like there's no point where that, that happened. Um Which is good. That's a great sign. I'm really proud of him. Um uh, there was still undue horniness. <sighs> Which is apparently unavoidable. Um, yeah. He's just so fucking horny. He's insane. Like, <laughs> it feels so crazy how horny this man is. Do meditation or I'm something, gonna bro. I'm going to be real. Masturbate. I'm going to be real. I've been reading. Right now, I've been reading through a bunch of books from, like, the late 20th century. Terry Pratchett books are actually significantly less horny than most of the others I've been reading. I mean, La Di Da like, right still now, fucking horny, though. <laughs> like, I'm rereading uh, the 87th Precinct books. It's a uh, police procedural. You guys would fucking hate it. Yeah, it sounds terrible. Um, Bootlicker. Yeah. And it is unbelievably fucking horny all the time. Like, I think... I find I read these books and I find myself uh, saying a prayer, just saying gra on my knees, saying my thanks for the ready availability of hardcore pornography nowadays, is I think it allows non-porn to be less horny. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's like a safety ball for horniness. I mean, yeah. I'm still going to call him horny. You're right. And I totally agree. There are a lot more horny books in the late 20th century. We're not we're not grading grading on a curve though. Like Yeah. I I don't care about the comparison to other people. He he's got to be responsible for I care about the comparison to one say. I care about the comparison to one single person, myself. He's more horny than I <laughs> yes. am. And therefore is wrong and bad. I don't God. actually think he is more horny than you. I think you're just horny in a different way. In yeah, motherfucker, way. I'm less horny because I'm not horny in a published fucking book. What are you fucking talking about? I'm horny with people who want to have sex with me. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Those are not comparable. <laughs> But like, yeah, I I liked. This is just this is just a fun book. I really enjoyed watching Dibbler's complete like descent into into uh, like Hollywood fever. Like, I thought he was a great kind of like he's is he an antagonist? He's kind of an antagonist. He's kind of an asshole. But he's really fun to watch. He is really fun to watch. I mean, he kind of always um, is, right? Like, he's he's not quite yeah. an antagonist, yeah. but he's definitely pushing on the story. Um, he's, he's just great. Like, he's coming on Throat Dibbler. Oh, God. Everything about those lines. I mean... I loved the description of Cut Me On Throat Dibbler is the best salesman in Ink More Pork, not because he can sell Cut Me On Throat Dibbler's sausages, but because he can sell Cut Me On Throat Dibbler's sausages twice. Yeah. That is so yeah. good. I love that. That was that. a fucking killer bit. Because, um, you know, it's true, yeah. right? It's easy to sell an asshole something once. <laughs> doing it twice now that's difficult <laughs> and like i know Just we already know. talked about how good gaspo is but i want to talk a little bit more about specifics i like yeah. the idea that's set up in the beginning in this book that gaspo is like dog which means he's split split between the desire and need for human affection and approval but also an internal wolfiness and like desire or the freedom sorry uh, desire for like a back to the wild sort of idealization of what wolves are like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's trapped between domestication and wolfiness, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's and I think dog. he paints that really in a really enjoyable, really humorous way. Um, I think every part of that is really, in like, just really a treat. Um, That's delightful. Gaspo is my favorite character in this book. Yeah, Gaspo. I, I mean, he's mine too. Yeah. Being that weird, sarcastic asshole is just like perfect. <laughs> it's really there's really nothing better. Sort yeah. of. Uh, I think he does the sort of um, hard boiled on the outside, but soft and tender on the inside thing mm -hmm. perfectly. Yeah. Um, I think that's something that's really interesting to think about while talking about this book is that while, while he was writing this book, he had already started to write and consider on Small Gods, a book that would not release uh, until four, three, three books later. He would release Moving Pictures, Reaper Man, and Witches Abroad, all while trying to write and thinking about small gods. 
Small Gods being one of the best Discworld books, period. I mean, and for good reason, given the amount of work you put into it. Yeah. <laughs> Does um, not surprise me that that one took so long for him to write. Because that is a really thoughtful book. It is. And I think it's just interesting to look at this book and know that he was thinking about these ideas. That he was trying to write them down. You know, because we can see some of those metaphysical ideas get just a little bit fleshed out here, right? He's like, mm -hmm. just starting, you know, he's trying to evolve the dungeon dimensions into more than just a hellscape, right? Holy wood isn't necessarily all bad, right? There is lights and dreams and weirdness, and there's these little gremlins. Uh, I think this one has the... Uh the best sort of eldritch finale finale since light the light fantastic which as we talked about in earlier recordings he spent several books trying to replicate that returning to the dungeon dimensions trying to recapture the magic of that first finale and mm -hmm. generally failing yes i think this is the first book where he managed to do that since. and i think he does it by not doing it right like yeah he he gives a reason why you know the dungeon dimensions is interesting because it gives a reason why the wizards can't just magic it away instead of doing what he does in later books which is just say no wizards just don't magic shit away like it's just they just don't do that <laughs> <laughs> um and that's kind of what it is now is like yeah the, wiz the wizards don't just magic shit away, or they can't in this case, because it's from the dungeon dimensions, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, this scene is saved because it is in the real world, because it is that leaking through, you know, madness, um, which I really appreciated. You know, it definitely is a callback to those other ones without being rote, I guess, is what I'm thinking. Right, because a lot of yeah. those other endings felt yeah. very yeah. similar. Like equal rights just felt like a diminished version <laughs> of that same idea. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I like yeah. the As idea. As did sorcery. And I like the idea that the magic that was that had ripped the hole in reality to begin with was also what allowed them to defeat the monster. That just struck me as being such a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the scene where he's running up the flights of stairs and there are missing steps and they only need to exist for a flicker of a second is really nice. I thought that that was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hollywood magic never lasts long, but it always lasts just long enough. Well, and just yeah. getting to see a, a character with genre who's genre savvy, but like genuinely yeah. right i know i'm in an action movie therefore i can do this is a really great yeah. concept that honestly is hard to explore without becoming yeah fucking annoying right like yeah yeah that's a, that's an idea and a thing you can explore for like 10 minutes at best before you're like okay we get it now do the actual adventure <laughs> i think what how it works yeah. so well is because it's just a flash in the heat of a moment where it doesn't where it propels the story onward instead of stopping it dead so that the writer can aggressively nudge you in the ribs mm -hmm. which is how like a lot of meta genre savvy meta stories work yeah but you know this this it this were it really worked really well in this story in the way that he did it he, you know it's the last like final push and it's using the magic that the monsters the same magic that the monsters are using it's you know it's the like final of the build up of all of this like uh, this the hollywood magic that has been like inconveniencing them or like you know uh controlling they learn to control to the them. magic they learn to control the magic that has been controlling them which to mm -hmm. some extent for me 
and this is especially relevant again, talking about how he's going to talk about small gods. This is one of the first times we see, or one, one of the greater times that we see an early version of somebody becoming a true prophet or a true conduit of a god, right? Obviously, they're not <laughs> gods like they are in the rest of the series. They're these weird chthonic things that don't act like the gods the rest of the time. But he is acting like they do in this scene, right? I think it's it's mm-hmm. so great to see this early version of that, right? We're going to go back to this, you know, a hundred, hundred times, right? We're going to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's and, it, and you know, it, you know, it's already one of my favorite concepts that he has. I love the imagery and the conception of, like, actors for gods, of um, prophets, essentially, right? And going postal in small gods in Thief of Time in um, a couple, like fucking a bunch of shit, right? Like he does it all the time. Um, uh, Thud is another one where he does this. Um, he will have man act as God on the earth. Uh, I think it's mm-hmm. one of my favorite ideas. And I think it's one of the things, one of the action scenes type one of the action scene types that he writes the best, right? Because he genuinely avoids action scenes. He doesn't seem to feel very confident in interacting with them. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I know. God, I just love it, guys. Like, holy shit. I love every single one of that. And this is such an early version of that. And it's so well mm-hmm. done. It's so delightful to think about him using Hollywood magic, being... Being that hero, like, right, we'll get callbacks to this and going postal as well, right, where he gets that tingle in his smile and he becomes a different person. He's a showman. So all of a sudden, yeah. right, this, like, laid-back Victor becomes a showman who can go fight a 50-foot lady. <laughs> and I like that dawning realization that hits him where he starts with trying to explain to people that, no, that's not me on the screen. That's just pretend. Only to for it to suddenly hit me. Oh, their belief gives me the power to do this thing that I would not otherwise be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. It was just so good. Yeah. Man. No, this is, this is a really... This is a good one. I'm... I'm... I'm, I'm, yeah. This one was a lot of fun. This one was a lot of fun. You know, I really, I don't feel like I had a lot to say, but it really didn't need it, right? It was, it yeah. was funny, and what it had to say, you know, even though it was kind of small, was good enough, right? Like it didn't need to be that. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of fun and engaging moments from so many characters, which really showed again why Ankh-Morpork is the best place for him to tell these stories, right? Yeah. His ability to control a cast of complex, moving people and make them feel real is enchanting, right? The idea Mm -hmm. Interesting thing being that this is kind of in Ankh-Morpork, but it kind of isn't. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still using the... It's all the people are from Ankh-Morpork, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> everyone in Hollywood, Hollywood could be in Ankh-Morpork. If you did this whole story... I mean, the heroine isn't. Well, she could be in Ankh-Morpork, is what I mean. Yeah. Like, well... Like you all... could say that... That's like talk, me talking about somebody from Colorado and going, well, they could be from Seattle. Well... No, well, I mean, it's not because it's Seattle. Discworld. Like, right? You can't have a Clatchian <laughs> in Discworld without it being the port of the story, right? Uh, you can't have Granny Weatherwax just be in Ankhmore Park. Her story and her character wouldn't make sense to exist there. Yeah, but Ginger's origin is kind of pretty heavily rooted in the fact that she's from, like, this small rural area that has very limited not not her origin story being from Ankhmore Park. Just the story could like be taking place in Ankhmore Park in sort of a you know uh, 
social dynamic anyway i guess uh yeah like i i, I get what you're saying like yeah it it doesn't happen in ink more pork and you're right but it's still an ink more pork focused story it's a it's i a do story. agree with that it's a story it's about like, ink more pork and the people like a there third of this story takes place in ink more pork and most of the people in hollywood are from ink more pork or, At least most of the yeah, and it is, that we spend and they're, time with. they're creating stuff to market to ink more pork like that's yeah. the whole point the re the whole fan reaction and this phenomenon of people coming there are are mostly from ink more pork like like the whole the, it's the social dynamics that are so like related to the city yeah um, exactly and that's, yeah. That's all of this is marketed say. towards oh man ink pork. Huh. I love the running a hundred elephants joke. Yeah, it's such a weird line. <laughs> it's it's funny. It, it it doesn't have a purpose to the narrative, but it never out welcome like it never outstays its welcome like the wizards did for me. Oh no, no, not a hundred elephants, a thousand yeah, a thou- elephants. A thousand elephants. Which is too many elephants. <laughs> yeah, because it it, it absolutely uh, does not provide to the narrative, but. God, everyone remember that time Dibbler ordered a thousand fucking elephants and they just showed up at Angmore Pork after Dibbler lost all his money? It was like... Yeah, and then God knows what happens. I mean, that's a war is all I'm saying. I don't know. You got a thousand elephants say, at the like, gate of a city. <laughs> you're either getting paid or you're getting war. A, how do you make a thousand elephants stop moving if they want to move? You do not. That's just something I'm thinking of. <laughs> you you do not. Like, no I one will ever like, see a thousand elephants anymore. Like, I feel like... I really wish that there had been a bit in a later book where somebody was like, Hey, remember that time Ink Morpork got trampled by Same. a thousand elephants? I mean, Same. what I would love... And it was would, all Dibbler's fault. What I would love is is one of those moments where they say, like, the city's been burned down more times than you can count, and once even trampled down by elephants or something like that. That's what I would love yes. to see. Yeah. Yes, I, I would like, love that. add it on to the list. Because they, they do those lines, like, every, every book, fucking where book like, where there's this is, this is how all these things have happened to ink more just from now on just add a thousand elephants yeah. trampled it mm-hmm. like like it would fit right in and it would it be would. really funny <laughs> <laughs> uh. God. oh i also liked laddie a lot i thought he was oh yeah the dog laddie the wonder dog it was he warmed really my heart funny. And the interactions between Gaspo and Laddie were pretty great. Like, yeah, I yeah, this like mix of like taking this dog under your wing and like hating this dog for for like. I love that bit where Gaspo has has to tell these humans that there are that these people have been trapped in. In a tunnel, in a collapsed tunnel. Hmm. Yeah. Only, he can't, and so only like just no one cannot believe that this dog would talk, so they don't hear him. And Laddie ends up pantomiming it, pantomiming it to them successfully. It's brutal. Yeah. It's so good. It's it's really funny. I mean, it's just the whole addition of Laddie. I mean, God, the the amount of references and and how funny they are is really indescribable. This is one of those books. It's like, it's really hard to review and it's really hard to talk about because like, the overarching narrative is good, you know. It's it's pretty fine, <laughs> but what makes this book so delightful and so outclassing almost all the other ones is that every single joke on it just fucking hits. And every single yeah. moment with every character just works so well. And and there's Except a hundred... Except for the main cast. 
Honestly, even a lot of their scenes fucking work. Like, I was fucking laughing. (laughs) Okay, that is true. I was laughing at a lot of those fucking scenes where they're having their weird little banter about bullshit. Like, that was funny. It didn't advance them as characters, but there was a lot of funny conversation between them. Yeah. And I mean, and that's why it makes this book so hard to review, right? There's no overarching story. Ending with Gaspo was brutal, where they just do not save him. I know. Yeah. It works, though, Gaspo for him. Gaspo deserves so much better justice I mean, for my boy Gaspo. No, because Gaspo can't be Gaspo if he gets better. That's the point, right? If Gaspo's fed steak every night, he's not Gaspo. He's not a wild dog, right? Then he's kept. Then he's possessed, and he doesn't really want that. He doesn't want to lap and beg and duck for every human command, like Laddie does, to just to get some steak. He needs to be mistreated. He needs to be ignored because he's a street dog through and through. Right? Sounds like Gaspo needs therapy. I mean, yes, but dogs don't get therapy. Humans barely get therapy. <laughs> I'm just saying. And this is Britain. Are there therapists there in 1990? Do that? Is that real? I don't think so. Um, oh. I think that might have been a little too real and now the jokes are dead. <laughs> well, I think that the main idea is pass around. If you haven't read this book and you're somehow listening to this, Go fucking read it. Nothing we've spoiled actually matters anywhere near every single fucking joke they tell in this book. Mm-hmm. Every single weird little like, interaction. Oh my god, the stars in their jokes eyes. That I tried oh. to describe and failed. Because it's it's mm-hmm. it's picking it apart, right? It's the dead frog thing. Yeah. Right. We we can't pick apart those jokes. They exist in perfection. He did them right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. They're they're so well done. (sighs) Go read this book. That's what I got. This is a good fucking book. I'm ranking this, I think, number one. I don't think it has the best... Wait, what? Uh, I don't know. Let me look at my list. Let me look. Let Let me pull up the Excel. Because you're right that it doesn't... Like, it doesn't have the same strength and overarching narrative... But I, I, I might have liked it more than Guards Guards, y'all. Might have to knife fight you. <laughs> I'm, I mean, it's a real toss up, right? The, the Guards Guards and and this book have, I think, very different strengths. Um, I think Guards I mean, Guards, as a whole narrative, was was substantially better. But a lot of the jokes. Yeah, by like a lot. Yes, but heck, I. I'm putting this below Weird Sisters. Oh, well, I think that's wrong. Um, that's insane to me. Weird Sisters is great. Weird Sisters is great. And, you know, maybe this is primacy. But, um, you know, there's, you know, it's been fucking two months or whatever since we read Weird Sisters. I think that this story had problems in some ways. Um, but all the problems I think it had just were the s- fact that the two main characters are so much less compelling than the main characters of either Weird Sisters or Guards Guards, and yeah. the fact that the overarching narrative is so much less meaningful. Yes, but for me, um, you know, at the end of the day, he's a comedy writer, and this has by far been my favorite comedy of the bunch you know Mm -hmm. i i think that there are i think that it will be dethroned (laughs) very strongly right we're still in the very early days of his work but for me this book shows a lot of what makes his comedy so special an examination of people in the face of new stimuli the criticism of our behavior and also the delight in it when we get these oddities, these unusual things that happen in our reality and started happening faster and faster and faster throughout Terry Pratchett's lifetime, right? A lot of his writing is so involved with that concept, partially because of precisely when he lived, right? Mm -hmm. 
our lives are not going to be at all like our parents' lives, and so on and so forth. And that has only gotten worse. Children born three years apart can have entirely different experiences to absurdist degrees, right? Um, that's why his work focuses on it so much. And I think he has brilliant things to say about that in his humor. And this is the first real example of that that I found in his work. You know, Guards, Guards is fantastic. Its overarching narrative is brilliant, but it still has problems. And a lot of the jokes don't land and the themes can get a little messy. Um, same is true with Weird Sisters. Honestly, if Weird Sisters didn't I... have that fucked up romance between with the fool, I would probably <laughs> feel a lot better about putting it higher. So... That's See, that's why I think for that me. thing about the themes in Guards Guards being messy is completely wrong. I think about like I think about Guards Guards constantly in relation to my day to day life and things I observe. I think a lot I think about it a lot when I think about politics. Like, oh man, I've just never disagreed with you more than I do now in this moment. Fight. Fight, 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 fight. Hey, Mulch, uh, where are you going to rank this? I realize well, hold on. you're going to be. <laughs> yeah, Mulch, Mulch well, put your fucking ring in the hat. Where are you ranking this book? I am ranking it. I am also ranking it below Guards Guards. And that's because I care a lot about characterization. I do agree that this had some of the best like comedy in any uh, above like any of the other books. But I didn't connect to the character, the main characters as well, and that puts it below the book, the book for me. What about above? What about weird sisters? Yeah. What about weird sisters? Well, I rated weird sisters above guards guards. So. Oh, I see. I see. Oh. So you are in agreement with Michi. Yes. Um. <laughs> yes, I am. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's um, and fine. it's it's because it's because of the characterization. It's because I value characterization so much that like while this did have excellent like side character characterization, like it had it had really really good side character characterization. Just the the characters we spent the most time with, it didn't it didn't hit for me. Yeah, and you know I agree with that, right? Characterization is immensely important to me, but for me, the side character characterization was enough. We we yeah, you know, I, from my perspective, we spend more time with side characters than we actually do with Victor and Ginger. Mm -hmm. Or at the uh -huh. very least, if we are spending time with Victor and Ginger, the scene is often about a side character, and that's what. Mm -hmm made that not an issue for me. You know, I went through this entire book not really worrying about who the fuck Victor and Ginger were. <laughs> because yeah. I was having such a good time with every single one of the side characters that appeared. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I just... Break it differently. Uh, sorry, my cat is screaming at me. No, right we now. can hear her. Don't worry. Hey, baby. Big fan of self advocacy, Silver Bells. Um, oh. All right, on the group list, then, are we putting it number three above Pyramids and below Weird Sisters? Yes. What's number? What are? The, what's number one? Our current order guards, guards, is Guards, weird Guards. Sisters. As, yeah, it's Guards, Guards, Weird Sisters, Pyramids, Light Fantastic, Mort, Eric, Equal Rights, Color of Magic, Sorcery. <laughs> Fuck, I hate sorcery. I'm excited to knock down uh, Light Fantastic even more because it uh, is honestly disgusting seeing it that high up. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, it should go see, away. Light, <laughs> Light Fantastic for me is... Um, uh, third from the bottom of the list it's only only above color of magic and sorcery i am the same way i have the exact same order <laughs> i can't believe that my that my fondness for light fantastic has managed to keep it so high on the it's list. actually insane yeah. i will correct this yeah. injustice later because <laughs> that's wrong it's not better it's not better than eric for instance 
I think my overwhelming... See, I strongly disagree with that, but whatever. I know you do. My I know you strong do. I, contempt. Yeah. My hatred for equal rights, like... Yes. I'm going to be disgusted when I see how high equal rights is. I'm, I'm, you know, I, every every time list. you complain about it, I actually move equal rights up one spot. Um. Sick and uh, twisted. <laughs> yeah, equal rights for me is, a, is um, fifth from the bottom. It's above every Rincewind book. Uh, <laughs> yes, equal rights for me is currently number five. With pyramids, weird sisters, moving pictures, and guards, guards above it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, equal rights is below Mort for me, but it's just because I fucking hated Mort, Mort so Mort's really low for me. <laughs> yeah, Mort was mostly just boring to me. It wasn't like, but boring Mort, for me like... is the worst crime a book can commit. Yeah. If I fall asleep during your book, it's the worst book I've ever read because at least I'm not. Like, at least when I hate yeah. a book, I'm feeling strongly about it, right? Uh-huh. Um, Mort, for me, is, like, it's just unmemorable. It's a book that slides in and out of my brain like water off of a rock. I know. Anybody yeah. who says, there are a couple people, because I watched that Mort, uh, like, university movie, and there are a lot of people in the comments, like, Mort is my favorite Discworld book. And I'm like... How? What, the fuck? what is wrong with you that Mort's your favorite of all the Discworld book? Mort? Holy shit, dude. We gotta get you a motherfucking education. We gotta, like, Speaking we gotta. Speaking of the death books, though, the next book up is Reaper Man. Oh, yeah, buddy. I'm Which so I think excited. Is my... It's not my favorite death book, but it is my favorite book about death character. Yeah. Yeah, it's Excited. this is this is one of the only early books that I I did read when I was younger. I've forgotten almost all of it, um, except for little scenes, which I'm sure will bring quite a joy to my heart. Yeah, same, same. Um, uh, I'm really excited to get back to it. I'm really, I'm really, really excited. Uh, I am leaving to another country for an entire month in fucking five days, but uh, you know maybe we'll do it. <laughs> This next one. I don't know what my connection's yeah. gonna be like out there in the wild yonder. It's gonna be really See? funny because we'll be recording at like one AM in the morning and I'll be so and I'll be happy and Mulch will die. So if I'll we recorded fine. at fine two PM if we recorded at two PM it, it's eleven over there. 11 p.m. So we'd probably do. Oh, that. I was talking about. I was talking about like 1 a.m. in the morning. I I know. I'm saying that we don't have to do that. <laughs> There's no reason to do could. that. No. no. <laughs> I mean, I don't really want to record a podcast at fucking 10 a.m. for me. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> do you remember all the last time we did a 10 a.m. recording? Uh, yeah, I'll just get in here. Uh, Reaper Man's great. I'm really hungover because all I've been doing is partying and fucking for fucking a month. Uh, mm -hmm. Reaper Man's killer. Loved it. C good night. <laughs> Fall asleep on a fucking call. <laughs> and after Reaper Man is Witches Abroad, which is one of the first Discworld books I've ever read and one of my favorites. Yeah. I'm excited to. Witches Abroad was one of the first uh, Discworld books that I reread while I was getting back into it, prior to us talking about doing this. Um, I, I was think not... Curtis and I are going to fight. Yeah. I know you're going to fight. I think it's going to be a really difficult one. I was not super into Witches Abroad. Um... I am excited to retouch. My favorite Granny Weatherwax book. Which is so fucked up and wrong and bad and wrong and incorrect. Um, <laughs> that part for sure is incorrect and bad and wrong. Um, I'm really fascinated. I want to know what it's like now. I haven't read it before. I, I yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a bad book by any means, right? It's still a Terry Pratchett novel, but, you know, it, it, it has some problems. Some issues, some things. 
I'm excited to go to it, having now read Equal Rights and Weird Sisters uh, in advance of it, and having a, a different understanding of these characters. But mm-hmm. it's, it's not my thing. <laughs> this is going to be a very contentious episode. Yeah, I think it, it might maybe It'll come be up violent. violent. There'll be bloodshed and mulch. I wouldn't get too comfortable because you're going to be the tiebreaker again. Yeah, I know. I mean, I the know. honest truth is that, though, on our ranking list, is that you feel everything more strongly than we do. So your opinion on a book affects its ranking more than either of our opinions. It's true. I'm so proud of myself. Single-handedly I mean, keeping Light Fantastic at the midpoint of the list. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm gonna fucking move it. I'm gonna go pull for a revote because it's a fucking bad book, y'all. It has a good finale. Yeah, I it's, say a, it's that a, every time. It's a shame about the entire rest of the book, though, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame about Are literally every other doing, section. Are we going to end up doing a Light Fantastic episode part two? Yeah, Light Fantastic Cage Match. <laughs> That's what we yeah. should call that episode. <laughs> I really don't I want to, do it. though. It's just a bad book. It doesn't even deserve this amount of conversation. It's one of his, like, yeah. earliest pieces of writing. It's, like, not bomb. We've talked I about like it so it. much, too. I know, because, because it is like one it. of... Because, because Michi likes it, and I think it is just relevant as one of his really early works. Right? Like, there's, there's just mm-hmm. no way around that. Yeah. And it's kind of like the first ending he wrote. Or the first conclusion to any story he's written. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we haven't read his earliest books. We don't know. I mean, the first conclusion to a Discworld. Sorry. Yeah. I forgot that he has written things that are not Discworld. Um, you should read his earliest books. I want to suffer. I want to suffer. The Carpet People? I've read The Carpet People, actually. How Is was it, it? It's fine. It's like... It's fine. I don't... It's fine. <laughs> I, th- I think that I might have read the revised edition instead of the, like, original re- the release. So it's like... Sort of like I've never read the original Ender's Game. Okay, well, that's weird. I didn't I mean, know there... I mean, was I've a... read the Ender's Game novel. I just know that he rewrote that. I've never read the first version he originally published oh you mean the short story yeah oh okay that's fine you don't have to read the short story i I thought you were talking that there was a revised edition of ender's game and you'd never read it but there isn't there's just a short story yeah okay 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 that's fine that's fine i mean it's a little weird because you have talked to me about orson scott card more than any human being alive but Uh uh-huh we um, all have regret. God, we all have our regrettable youths. If I mean, Speaker for you... the Dead is still one of my favorite books ever made, so I don't think that's regrettable. If either of you ever liking uh... Ender's liking, see, they're good books, but l- being as emotionally invested in Ender's Game as I was as a high schooler is actually deeply regrettable. I mean, I think that you were just kind of coming to terms with some some internal sexuality stuff, because you were talking to me a lot about Orson Scott Card's homophobia. Yeah, I was, but... Like a lot, bring, like a great deal. Hours up. of conversation on Orson let's Scott Card's homophobia. Let's not bring this <laughs> up inside of this podcast, okay? No, I need this on recording. We all, I need we this on recording. We all have things that we're ashamed of. Chio and I used to go oh. on five miles walk, five mile walk, just go get this pint of custard and, and eat it in a park and, and go back to school. I mean, oh, we no. were skipping fucking classes and we was, yeah. we could spend that whole time talking about Orson Scott Card's homophobia yeah. and the intertextual evidence of gayness within kind of Ender's <laughs> Game and, and other, uh, does that series yeah, have I like a these conversations? We should, we should I, go get. I've had this conversation get, with you too. Yep. You should go get old school frozen custard before it closes because it's closing soon. Is it like for real, real closing? 
I think it is. I won't be able to survive I... in this goddamn city anymore. I was by there. I got some... Oh, my God. It might have already fucking closed. There's no point in living this goddamn... This fucking... Let me, this let me goddamn, check. Nope. I found an Eater article. Goddamn old school frozen custard. Closed this after 12 years. No plans to reopen the shop at the another location. Closed August 23rd, 2021. Oh, there's no point in living. I hate oh. this. Oh. Oh, God. I want um, ice cream now. Oh, this uh, is Salt and Straw's fault. I'm gonna go kill. I'm gonna go to, kill Salt and Straw's guy. Are you fucking with me, Salt and Straw? What? I mean, old school frozen custard. Yeah, dude. People love Salt and Straw. People have been lining up around the fucking block for Salt and Straw. Murder. I know. Old school frozen custard is like the finest fucking ice cream in this goddamn fucking city. They had an almond roca. Oh, their almond custard. roca frozen custard was so good. Oh, I no, hate I this fucking, ice cream. I hate this fucking city. <laughs> I hate this fucking city. I hate Seattle. I know. Did you we go to Husky Deli? Did you know that? Oh, we should go to Huskies. I'll go to Huskies. Um, oh, we should go to Husky Deli. I was at Huskies yesterday, actually. <laughs> um, nice. Fuck me. Did you know that half of White Center is burned down? Yeah. Wait, what? Half of White Center is just like absolutely burned to the fucking ground. What happened? Um, it <laughs> seems like a bunch of fires were maybe intentionally started in certain businesses, maybe. Was it like an insurance thing? Three fires now. Three fires now? There was a third one? Yeah, one of the uh, older places down the back street off the main street burned down, too. That's oh, a total of, like, nine that's... nine fucking businesses that have burned down. Yeah. So basically, in, oh, in like those are days. for sure on purpose. Basically, we're in the beginning of a really great uh, true crime episode on Seattle's Firebug. Or somebody is somebody is trying to get that insurance money, basically what you're saying uh well I'm... if they were trying to get their insurance money you need only need one fire it's not like the same person owns all of these businesses yeah like i mean they very you well got a could. fire bug. that's how like seattle works no they don't in white center that's not true they're mostly individually owned oh. businesses oh that's what i'm Ooh. saying it's like nine separate businesses with nine separate owners for the most part i think I think Bizarro and whatever the fuck was it next to Bizarro are partially owned together. Both are burned down. Um, uh, which that also... was probably just like somebody set one business on fire and then it hit the other business because that's how fire works. I mean, yeah, fire spreads. Um, but that's the second fire on that same street within the past 60 days. Yeah. It's it's crazy. So, so Bizarro is closed. Huangsha is closed. Tipica uh, closed. That fucking weird ballet boxing gym closed. Uh, there's a couple of other ones. That Mexican Mart in the back streets closed. It's it's insane. It's a lot of fires, y'all. Um, I like Mexican Marts. I love Mexican Marts. Asian Marts are slightly higher ranked for me than Mexican Marts, which I'm so sorry. To my own people. It's just true. <laughs> I also agree with that. Um, I'm Asian. But so... nothing can compare to the Mexican butcher. Oh. Just straight yeah. up and down. Mexican butcher beats every other butcher. Uh huh. You can get good, inexpensive cuts of meats that most, like, non Mexican shops would charge you your, like, left arm. For. Oh, they'd fucking gut you and take it from you in exchange. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's bullshit. <laughs> and they'll fucking marinate for you, and it'll be the best marinated thing you've ever had in your entire life. There's no compare. And they sell the best that's fucking the salsa thing, in the city. That's the one thing I miss about living in Burien. Like, Burien was shady and dangerous, <laughs> and you might get, like, murdered at any second for no reason. But, yeah. like... They had so much better grocery stores and butchers there. Oh, yeah. yeah. The yeah. shopping yeah. was just so much better than it was yeah. in Oh, yeah, Seattle. it is. It is in We're, Seattle. 
we're doing great on that front. Murder? Yeah, we got we got that, but we we got good bit of business. I mean, relatively, you've got low rates of like relative to America, you've got low rates of murder. Yeah, but like. I, I only, feared for my life more often in Burien. You did. And you, like, got you got uh, stood up. Uh, you you got uh, robbed, didn't you? Yeah, I got up. mugged. I got assaulted. I saw. I saw two uh, kids die. Um, get shot to death. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's Burien, the worst thing that happened while we were living in Burien. I mean, that by, one's like, pretty bad. Shot. Yeah. That was pretty um, bad, but all I'm saying is that 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 we still have significantly lower rates there than than average America. That's pretty yeah, but terrifying. It's like, we said about <laughs> like we don't care about how dangerous Burien is relative to the rest of America. I mean, that's important to me. It's important yeah, to me. It's important for me. It's important to me. Dangerous. It's important yeah, for it, me to does, remember that. It does make me significantly more concerned about the rest of America. I will say that. Well, fair. 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 Um, actually, our total violent crime rate in Burien appears to be lower than the homicide rate for America. So violent crimes of any kind, fewer of them happen in Burien than homicides in, in, uh, across America. That's so depressing. No, yeah, it's pretty crazy. That seems insane. <laughs> That's so depressing. Yeah. Yeah. I typed in Burien, and uh, the first question that Google Auto uh, offered was, is Burien Washington safe? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just like to remember that we live a very privileged life where we live in a, a city that is really quite safe. Mm -hmm. relative yeah. relative to but the rest of this there's country. Also something worth noting, which was when I lived on Burien, I was working night shift. Yes. Yeah. So I can't I would believe. be leaving at like the early hours of morning. And it was always like kind of a gamble sort of uh hmm, I'm leaving at like twelve AM in the morning. Am I going to make it home safely tonight? Yeah, no, I was scared as shit for you running that night shift and walking home in Burien. Yeah, and but I wasn't was, walking home. Well, I was busting home, but it was yeah. still like, yeah. not not better. Not not significantly uh, better. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot more waiting <laughs> and shit. Like that always. I was always scared as fuck for you because that was crazy. That was crazy. Yeah, I I work the. It's like crazy to me how much safer downtown at like night is than Burien at night. I mean, it's always so crazy. It I, feels like. It feels wrong. It feels like downtown should be more murdery than Burien because they're. I think different areas not. are just more dangerous to different people, right? Like when I'm downtown at night, it is more dangerous for me than Burien because the dudes will try and start. Sorry, uh, I think you cut out. Oh, I, I mean, I think it's just I think it's interesting because different areas are more dangerous to different people. So, like when I go downtown Seattle. At night, it's way more dangerous for me to be there than Burien at night. Because people will start shit with me. Because I'm like kind of a big person oh. and I walk with kind of a swagger. Mm -hmm. Oh. Right. So it's not dangerous for you for the most part. I'm sure you'll get some cat calls and some bullshit like that. But, you know, you're not going to get jumped so much downtown Seattle um, as you would downtown Burien. Whereas, you know, downtown Burien, sense. nobody's ever going to fuck with me. This is not a fucking chance. But downtown Seattle, dudes at McStabham's will have their little go. Acting tough. Sorry, I, you're cut out. <laughs> I said D dudes at McStabham's will have their little go acting tough. Holy shit, Purtis, what's going on with your internet connection? I don't know, every single human being... Walked in. Oh, there you are. Head. Hey guys, I can hear you the whole time. <laughs> um, every single human being is in my house and on the internet. Yeah. Ah, uh, I would explain it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we've just been talking about bullshit <laughs> for like I don't know 
30 minutes. This is unusable. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm here. I'm 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 the editor here. <laughs> I mean, you can leave it in the interesting bits. This can just be, you know, a friendly little podcast situation, but do you want a riddle? Do you want a riddle Ooh, as a sign? Oh. No, I don't. No, that I don't. That sucks. Come on, Mulch. Okay, give me give me a riddle. Give me a give number it. between 1 and 78. Um, 40. 40? Two fathers and two sons are in a car, yet there are only three people in the car. How? Two fathers and two sons are in a car. Um, father is the son to both kids, and that makes them a two people. What? I don't know. <laughs> the f you're so. I thought you had it for a second. I was going to be really proud of you. Nope. Nope. I don't know. I don't they're know. they're grandfather, me. father, and son. Oh. Because the, therefore the father is both a son and a father. There's two. Oh, I see. Two fathers and two sons are in oh, a car, that's... yet there are only three people in the car. How? I kind of like this one. Yeah, this one That's this one makes perfect. sense. This one you can actually think through. I'm gonna yeah, find you some I more actually bullshit. Ones. Riddle. I, I I I like that one. I really need to pee, so I think it might be. Yeah, this is sign off time. Uh, sign off. Thanks for those who listen. Good luck. Good night. <laughs> Send me riddles. <laughs> <laughs> Send riddles. That's it. If Think you got that, to, if uh, you got this far, if you listen to all of this, you now have to send us a riddle. Yep. Oh God! Uh, some rule. of that conversation I had with the assumption that you would be cutting it out. No, we're we're dropping it raw. Oh God! I am separating it. I am putting it into our talks section. Uh, if you so could be two please videos. leave in the part where we're roasting about the Orson Scott card. No. That part, that part's really critical for the understanding, I think, of this book. Um, I, uh, and and importantly, why Chio is wrong about the rankings for all the other books. No. <laughs> we'll we'll see. We'll see how it shakes out. No, I think I'm right. I think what that like section means is that we all need to hang out more. I mean, I'm leaving for a month. I cannot stress this enough. Yeah, but, but we like, should after you come out. Come I back. Know. I'm like kind of mad we didn't do a fire before the rains come because I'm gonna be gone for a month and then it's gonna be November and there's no fucking way. But that's okay. All right. All right. Got to pee. Good night, Take guys. Care of my See ya.